Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to a lovely jaunt where we read better, not more. Today is Wednesday, I'm back with my notes, and uh, we're gonna talk some more about Emma. I only read a couple of chapters, I am super behind you guys, and yet I have pages and pages of notes. And I think it's because we're kind of getting to the major conflict of the novel. So in this section, because Frank Churchill is in play, things are getting spicy. So I think one of my favorite lines in chapter seven is that Emma wants to sort of note how the distinguishment of Frank Churchill, and she defines it in this way. <laughs> and it's for Emma to be able to imagine that Frank Churchill might be in love with her. So not the other way around, not that she's imagining that she's in love with Frank, because of course that would violate her principle of not wanting to get married, but she's so snobbish that the distinguishment is that in her imagination, he's allowed to be in love with her. All right, and the invitation from the Coles, very interesting. Um, this is what, in my opinion, Emma gets for being so uppity and so snobbish. I'm in the mode where I don't like Emma quite as much in these chapters. The other thing that I see popping up in this novel over and over again is that the servants are actually quite present in this book compared to every other book. They're named, they're characters, they don't speak for themselves, they don't have a visible presence in the book, but they are frequently talked about by the characters in the book as well. Um, in chapter eight, the pianoforte sort of becomes another riddle for Emma to solve. But as with matters of the heart, she is wrong every single time and in every way. She even notices a particular smile in Frank Churchill's face when the pianoforte is being talked about and misinterprets it gets everything wrong the way she does. Uh, and, and then of course that reminded me that the reason that Frank Churchill went to London to get a haircut was also probably to facilitate this whole piano forte thing. The imagined affair with Mr. Dixon seems the cruelest thing that Emma has done yet. And in fact, when she reflects on it later, she just sort of questioned herself of how, co how proper it was for her to sort of voice her theory, I guess, but it seems like the cruelest bit of gossip that she could engage in because she has no idea. She has absolutely no grounds for this suspicion, and yet she's talking about Jane Fairfax in this way, and especially in the context of this society and these social rules, to suggest that there was some sort of improper affair or love between them is just really, really cruel. It's based on her own feelings of jealousy I think it really comes down to the fact that she really can't imagine that Miss Campbell, being inferior to Jane Fa Fairfax in any way, could attach the affection of a man to herself rather than to Jane in Jane's company, and that at the same time that Miss Campbell herself is not jealous of Jane because that's how Emma feels about Jane Fairfax. There is something really interesting about Emma and her intelligence, her observational skills, and how that comes in conflict with her fancies and imagination. So there's a lot of things that Emma sort of correctly observes. She observes that there must be a particular reason that Jane Fairfax is coming to Highbury rather than going to Ireland and staying with the Campbells. She misinterprets this as well. It's for Frank Churchill. Emma also notices that there's something odd about Frank Churchill's haircut. She misinterprets that. Frank Churchill's smile when they're talking about the piano. She mis misinterprets that. The piano itself, as she has to replace this Frank Churchill, is, he's this obvious candidate. He appears at the same time that Jane, Jane Fairfax does. My dog came in here to eat his food. He does that. He prefers to get a bite of his food from his bowl and then bring it into whatever room I'm in so that he can eat it near me, which is really sweet, but I'm sorry if you hear any crunch noises in the background. She has this perfect candidate to fill in for the confluence of circumstances that are here, but because in her imaginary world, Frank Churchill has to be in love with her, that means she has to sort of create these other imaginative circumstances to account for these different pieces of evidence that she's seeing, if you will. Now, the further question becomes, if 
is this pursuit of blindness and imagined reality also part of my thesis that Emma it is sort of avoiding her feelings towards Mr. Knightley? That Frank Churchill is the only other worthy young man according to Emma's snobbery, so she assumes she must be the natural match, even though she has no natural feelings for him whatsoever. And that's pretty obvious throughout that it seems to me that the way that Emma behaves is one of someone who doesn't really have any interest in him. And, <laughs> you know, all of this is also like a puzzle, it's like a riddle, but she gets all of the puzzle pieces wrong. In one sense, Emma's almost too rational to be able to figure this out, right? She's not emotional enough to clue into her own feelings, let alone to have real good insight into the feelings of other people. And then I think, how would Frank Churchill be experiencing this conversation that Emma, he and Emma are having together at the Coles? Emma's really, really close to figuring it out. Emma's really, really close. She noticed the smile. She noticed the pianoforte. She knows that Jane is there for a particular reason. Like all of these little clues, like they're on her mind. She's really, really close to figuring out their affair. And so I think that's why Frank Churchill encourages this idea that there's an improper affair between Jane Fairfax and Mr. Dixon, even though it doesn't reflect well on his own fiance. I think that's the reason why he pursues this ridiculous flirtation with her. And all of that sort of adds up to a really unique rereading experience in Emma, which is kind of like rewatching The Sixth Sense or rewatching Memento but backwards and seeing if you can now that you've had the reveal put together the scenes and see if you can put the scene the scenes together with this new interpretation of reality. Right and then there's one scene that I actually want to look at in depth and I actually want to read it to you so I'm going to grab my book really quickly. It's page 202. So this is the conversation with Mrs. Weston in which Mrs. Weston is putting forth the idea that Mr. Knightley might be in love with Jane Fairfax. Well, said Mrs. Weston, so smiling, you give him credit for more uh, simple, disinterested benevolence in this instance than I do. For while Miss Bates was speaking, a suspicion darted into my head, and I have never been able to get it out again. So here, Mrs. Weston is experiencing that same thing where it's sort of just being taken away with a flight of fancy that we see Emma experiencing over and over again when she has a random thought pop into her head. Wouldn't it be interesting if, and then she runs away with it as if it were reality. The more I think of it, the more probable it appears. In short, I have made a match between Mr. Knightley and Jane Fairfax. See the consequence of keeping you company? What do you say to it? Mr. Knightley and Jane Fairfax, exclaimed Emma. Dear Mrs. Weston, how could you think of such a thing? Mr. Knightley, Mr. Knightley must not marry. You would not have little Henry cut off from Danwell. Oh, no, no, Henry must have Donwell. I cannot at all consent to Mr. Knightley's marrying, and I am sure it is not at all likely. I am amazed that you should think of such a thing. My dear Emma, I have not told you, I have told you what led me to think of it. I do not want the match. I do not want to injure dear little Henry, but the idea has, give, has been given me by circumstances. And if Mr. Knightley really wishes to marry, you would not have him refrain on Henry's account, boy of six years old who knows nothing of the matter. And I thought this was a really interesting conversation because it really gets at the heart of the way in which imagination can work, it, sort of in conjunction with your will, I guess. And what it is is that Mrs. Weston is imagining what could be possible on the basis of what she's observed in other people. Emma imagines what she wants. And there is a big difference. This is why Emma will continue to be blind until throughout the course of the novel to what's actually going on around her because she's not interested in seeing reality as what it is. This is something we've talked about already all the time but she uses her imaginative forces to try to impose upon reality her will. I think Emma also cloaks alarm for herself as alarm for Henry being displaced in place of her being displaced in Mr. Knightley's affections. So she uses him as an excuse to be upset when it's like she's actually upset, when she's actually jealous, when she's the one who's actually interested in Mr. Knightley. But we already talked about why that might be an uncomfortable admission 
So that is what I have for you today. I promise I'm going to get some more reading done tonight so that we can have maybe a little bit something new to talk about. Until next time, I'm Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.